Section 18 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 18. How Cheops Built His Pyramid. By Herodotus. Cheops, ruler of Egypt about 4000 B.C., was the builder of the Great Pyramid. This was 481 feet high, made of large blocks of stone. The sides were covered with limestone, cut so as to make a smooth slope. But this has been carried away to use elsewhere, and whoever wishes to climb the pyramid must drag himself up the high, rough steps formed by the blocks. The Editor Now they told me that in the reign of Rhampsinitis there was a perfect distribution of justice, and that all Egypt was in a high state of prosperity, but that after him Cheops, coming to reign over them, plunged into every kind of wickedness. For that, having shut up all the temples, he first of all forbade them to offer sacrifice, and afterwards he ordered all the Egyptians to work for himself. Some, accordingly, were appointed to draw stones from the quarries and the Arabian mountain down to the Nile. Others he ordered to receive the stones when transported in vessels across the river, and to drag them to the mountain called the Libyan. And they worked to the number of a hundred thousand men at a time, each party during three months. The time during which the people were thus harassed by toil lasted ten years on the road which they constructed, along which they drew the stones, a work, in my opinion, not much less than the pyramid, for its length is five status, footnote, five-eighths of a mile, end of footnote, and its width, ten orgii, footnote, sixty feet, end of footnote, and its height, where it is the highest, eight orgii, and it is of polished stone, with figures carved on it. On this road, then, ten years were expended, and in forming the subterranean apartments on the hill on which the pyramids stand, which he had made as a burial vault for himself, in an island formed by draining a canal from the Nile. Twenty years were spent in erecting the pyramid itself. Of this, which is square, each face is eight plethora, footnote, about eight hundred feet, end of footnote, and the height is the same. It is composed of polished stones, and jointed with the greatest exactness. None of the stones are less than thirty feet. This pyramid was built thus, in the form of steps, which some call crossi, others bomides. When they had first built it in this manner, they raised the remaining stones by machines made of short pieces of wood. Having lifted them from the ground to the first range of steps, when the stone arrived there, it was put on another machine that stood ready on the first range, and from this it was drawn to the second range on another machine, for the machines were equal in number to the ranges of steps, or they removed the machine, which was only one, and portable, to each range in succession, whenever they wished to raise the stone higher for I should relate it in both ways, as it is related. The highest parts of it, therefore, were first finished, and afterwards they completed the parts next following. But last of all they finished the parts on the ground, and that were lowest. On the pyramid is shown an inscription in Egyptian characters, how much was expended in radishes, onions and garlic for the workmen, which the interpreter, as I well remember, reading the inscription, 
told me amounted to sixteen hundred talents of silver. And if this be really the case, how much more was probably expended in iron tools, in bread, and in clothes for the laborers, since they occupied in building the works the time which I mentioned, and in no short time besides, as I think, in cutting and drawing the stones, and in forming the subterranean excavation. End of section 18 This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by the Story Girl Building the Pyramids by Gustav Richter Germany, 1823-1884 to 1884. Painting, page 68 This picture shows more vividly than any written explanation the state of society that made the building of these gigantic sepulchres possible. The king, all-powerful as a ruler, and even worshipped by his subjects as a god, has come to see with his own eyes the progress his slaves are making with the pyramid. Born aloft on his chair of state, shielded from the sun by immense fans of ostrich feathers, and accompanied by his favoured wife, he surveys with imperious glance the structure that is rising at his bidding, while about him swarm thousands of wretched slaves and captives, toiling to build a tomb that shall be worthy of so mighty a monarch. It is believed that each king, at the outset of his reign, began a pyramid which should serve as his tomb and should ensure the immortality of his soul by the preservation of his body. There are some seventy-five of the Egyptian pyramids still existing, the largest of these being the Great Pyramid, which was built by Cheops. Its base measures 750 feet on a side, and its perpendicular height is 451, some thirty feet less than it was originally. It has been calculated that the two million three hundred thousand blocks of which it is composed weigh six million tons, and that it contains sufficient stone to build a city large enough to house a hundred and twenty thousand people. How these mighty piles were reared is not yet fully understood. In the finer work, the hard stones were cut by bronze saws set with jewels, and diamond rock drills were also used. But how the great blocks of stone were brought from the farther side of the Nile, and how they were raised into their places, is a mystery. It is recorded that merely to build the causeway from the quarry to the banks of the Nile required the labor for ten years of a hundred thousand men changed every three months. Expense, suffering, human life, and labor were not regarded as of the least importance. But even with this advantage, it is said that Cheops was hard put to it to raise the money necessary to complete the enormous structure. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 20, Karnak and the hall of columns by charles dudley warner the weather is almost unsettled there was actually a dash of rain against the cabin window last night over before you could prepare an affidavit to the fact and to-day is cold more or less cloudy with a drop 
only a drop of rain occasionally besides the wind is in the southwest and the sand flies we cannot sail and decide to visit karnak in spite of the entreaty of the handbook to leave this as the crown of all sightseeing until we have climbed up to its greatness over all the lesser ruins perhaps this is wise but i think i should advise a friend to go at once to karnak and outrageously astonish himself while his mind is fresh and before he becomes at all sated with ruins or familiar with other vast and exceedingly impressive edifices they are certain to dull a little his impression of karnak even madam it is abd el ati who comes in rubbing his hands your carriage stops the way carriage yes ma'am i just make him the carriage was an armchair slung between two pushing poles between each end of them was harnessed a surly diminutive donkey who seemed to feel his degradation each donkey required a driver ahmed with his sleeves rolled up and armed with a big club walked beside to steady the swaying chair and to beat the boys when their donkeys took a fancy to lie down and a cloud of interested arabs hovered about it running with it adding to the noise dust and picturesqueness of our cavalcade on the outskirts of the mud cabins we pass through the weekly market a motley assemblage of country folks and produce camels donkeys and sheep it is close by the gawazi quarter where is a colony of a hundred or more of these dancing girls they are always conspicuous among egyptian women by their greater comeliness and gay apparel they wear red and yellow gowns many tinkling ornaments of silver and gold and their eyes are heavily darkened with coal i don't know what it is in this coal that it gives woman such a wicked and dangerous aspect they come out to ask for bakshish in a brazen but probably intended to be a seductive manner they are bold but some of them rather well-looking they claim to be an unmixed race of ancient lineage but i suspect their blood is no purer than their morals there is not much in egypt that is not hopelessly mixed of the mile and a half avenue of sphinxes that once connected luxor with karnak we see no trace until we are near the latter the country is open and beautiful with green wheat palms and sycamores great karnak does not show itself until we are close upon it its vast extent is hidden by the remains of the wall of circuit by the exterior temples and pylons it is not until we have passed beyond the great but called small temple of rameses the third at the north entrance and climb the pyramidal tower to the west of the great hall that we begin to comprehend the magnitude of these ruins and that only days of wandering over them and of study would give us their gigantic plan karnak is not a temple but a city rather a city of temples palaces obelisks colossal statues it is like a city a growth of many centuries it is not a conception or the execution of a purpose it is the not always harmonious accretion of time and wealth and vanity of the slowness of its growth some idea may be gained from the fact that the hieroglyphics on one face of one of its obelisks were cut two hundred and fifty years after those on the opposite face so long ago were both chiselled however they are alike venerable to us i shouldn't lose my temper with a man who differed with me only a thousand years about the date of any event in egypt they were working at this mass of edifices sacred or profane all the way from oser tassin the first down to alexander the second that is from about three thousand sixty four b c according to mariette bunsen twenty seven eighty one wilkinson twenty eighty it doesn't matter to only a short time before our era 
there was a modest beginning in the plain but chaste temple of osirtasem but each king sought to outdo his predecessor until sethi the first forever distanced rivalry in building the great hall and after him it is useless for any one else to attempt greatness by piling up stones the length of the temples pylons and obelisks en suite from west to east is eleven hundred and eighty feet but there are other outlying and gigantic ruins i suppose it is fully a mile and a half round the wall of circuit there is nothing in the world of architecture like the great hall nothing so massive so surprising and for me at least so crushingly oppressive what monstrous columns and how thickly they are crowded together their array is always compared to a forest the comparison is apt in some respects but how free uplifting is a forest how it expands into the blue air and lifts the soul with it a piece of architecture is to be judged i suppose by the effect it produces it is not simply that this hall is pagan in its impression it misses the highest architectural effect by reason of its unrelieved heaviness it is wonderful it was a prodigious achievement to build so many big columns the setting of enormous columns so close together that you can only see a few of them at one point of view is the architecture of the great hall upon these big stones are put for a roof there is no reason why this might not have been repeated over an acre of ground neither from within nor from without can you see the extent of the hall footnote the great hall measures one hundred and seventy feet by three hundred and twenty nine in this space stand one hundred and thirty four columns twelve of these forming the central avenue of one hundred and seventy feet are sixty-two feet high without plinth and abacus and eleven feet six inches in diameter the other one hundred and twenty-two columns are forty-two feet five inches in height and about nine feet in diameter the great columns stand only fifteen or sixteen feet apart End of footnote. the best view of it is down the centre aisle formed by the largest columns and as these have height as well as bulk and the sky is now seen above them the effect is of the highest majesty this hall was dimly lighted by windows in the clerestory the frames of which exhibit a freedom of device and grace of carving worthy of a gothic cathedral these columns all richly sculptured are laid up in blocks of stone of half the diameter the joints broken if the egyptians had dared to use the arch the principle of which they knew in this building so that the columns could have stood wide apart and still upheld the roof the sight of the interior would have been almost too much for the human mind the spectator would have been exalted not crushed by it not far off is the obelisk which amunu het erected to the memory of her father i am not sure but it will stand long after the hall of sethi is a mass of ruins for already is the water sapping the foundations of the latter some of the columns lean like reeling drunken men and one day with crash after crash these giants will totter and the blocks of stone of which they are built will make another of those shapeless heaps to which sooner or later our solidest works come the red granite shaft of the faithful daughter lifts itself ninety-two feet into the air and is the most beautiful as it is the largest obelisk ever raised the sanctuary of red granite was once very rich and beautiful the high polish of its walls and the remains of its exquisite carving no less than the colours that still remain attest that the sanctuary is a heap of ruins thanks to that ancient shaker cambyses but the sculptures in one of the chambers are the most beautiful we have seen the colours red blue and green are still brilliant the ceiling is spangled with stars on a blue firmament 
considering the hardness of this beautiful cyanite and the difficulty of working it i think this is the most admirable piece of work in thebes it may be said of some of the sculptures here especially of the very spirited designs and intelligent execution of those of the great hall that they are superior to those on the other side of the river and yet there is endless theological reiteration here there are dreary miles of the same gods in the same attitudes and you cannot call all of them respectable gods the longer the religion endured the more conventional and repetitious its representations became the sculptors came to have a traditional habit of doing certain scenes and groups in a certain way and the want of life and faith in them becomes very evident in the sculptures of the ptolemaic period in this vast area you may spend days and not exhaust the objects worth examination on one of our last visits we found near the sacred lake very striking colossal statues which we had never seen before when this city of temples and palaces the favourite royal residence was entire and connected with luxor by the avenue of sphinxes and the great edifices and statues on the west side of the river were standing this broad basin of the nile enclosed by the circle of rose-coloured limestone mountains which were themselves perforated with vast tombs must have been what its splendid fame reports when it could send to war twenty thousand chariots but i wonder whether the city aside from its conspicuous temples and attached palaces was one of mud hovels like those of most peoples of antiquity and of the modern egyptians end of section twenty this recording is in the public domain section twenty one of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by the story girl colonnade of the temple of rameses the third at thebes photograph page seventy four apparently the chief design of egyptian architecture was not to attract or charm the beholder but to impress on him the sense of his own insignificance and overwhelm him with awe before the superhuman greatness of the monarchs at whose command these temples and palaces had been erected the colonnade shown in this picture is part of a great temple built about twelve thirty b c by rameses the third on the west bank of the nile a massive gateway leads into a pavilion whose walls are beautifully adorned with bas-reliefs beyond this pavilion is a sumptuous colonnaded court another gate leads into a second colonnaded court about one hundred and twenty-five feet by one hundred and thirty-eight part of which is seen in the illustration in early christian times a coptic village was built around and upon the ruins of the temple edifices and this second colonnade was used as a church end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain section twenty two of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 22, How to Excavate a Buried Town. By W. M. Flinders Petrie. Probably most people have somewhat the ideas of a worthy lady who asked me how to begin to excavate a ruined town should you begin to dig at the top or at the side a cake where raised pie was apparently in her mind and the only question was where to best reach the inside of it now there are ruins and ruins they may differ greatly in original nature in the day they have been destroyed and in the history of their degradation 
the only rule that may be called general is that digging must be systematic chance trenches or holes seldom produce anything in themselves they are but feelers the main acquirement always needed is plenty of imagination imagination is the fire of discovery the best of servants though the worst of masters a habit of reasoning out the most likely cause and all other possible causes for the condition of things as seen is essential if there is a slope of the ground a ridge a hollow why is it there what can have produced it and which cause is the most probable for it the mere form of the ground will often show plainly what is beneath it is there a smooth uniform mound of large size then a mass of house ruins of a town may be expected is there a steep edge to it around then there was a wall either of the town or of some one large building which forms the whole ruin is there a ring of mounds with a central depression then there was a temple or a large permanent building with house ruins around it is there a gentle slope up one side and a sharp fall on the other then it is a rubbish mound is the mass high above the general soil then several successive layers of habitation may be expected so even from afar some ideas may be gleaned before setting foot on a ruined site when we reach our town and walk over it much more can be seen of what is beneath very likely it seems all irregular hillocky dusty ground and who can say what it may cover in one place however we find that there are no chips of potsherds lying about track around and find the space of this clearance probably it runs along for some distance you are on the top of a mud brick wall denuded down to the level of the rubbish in which it is buried follow the clear space and you will outline the fortifications of the city or its temple or perhaps you notice a difference in the vegetation no plants will grow on particular ground here is probably a mass of hard mud brick or stonework without moisture or nutriment and you will thus find the walls or there is a hollow or old pit met with here the modern natives have been digging out stone masonry and around it or below may be the rest of a building some symmetrical form of the mounds can be detected and we are perhaps led at once to the temple or to trace out the streets of the town or a patch of ground is reddened with fire showing that a house has been burned there and probably stone and metal and pottery may remain intact in the ruins but our special notice must be given to the potsherds lying strewn all over the surface pottery is the very key to digging to know the varieties of it and the age of edge is the alphabet of work not that it is more distinctive in itself than most other products of various ages but it is so vastly commoner than anything else that a place may be dated in a minute by its pottery on the surface which would require a month's digging in the inside of it to discover as much from inscriptions or sculptures a survey showing the form of the ground and the position of every fragment or indication that can be of use is essential to understanding it and will often point out by the probable symmetry of parts what are the best spots to examine first having then made out as much as possible beforehand we begin our diggings if there appear to be remains of a temple or some larger building which should be thoroughly examined we first make pits about one edge of the site and find how far out the ruins extend having settled that a large trench is dug along the whole of one side reaching down to the undisturbed soil beneath and about six or eight feet wide at the bottom all the earth being heaped on the outer edge of the trench then the inner side is dug away and the stuff thrown up on the outer side by a row of men all along the trench thus the trench is gradually swept across the whole site always taking from one side and throwing back on the other each block of stone or piece of building found is surveyed and covered over again if not wanted sculptures or inscriptions are either removed or rolled up onto the surface of the stuff or remain exposed in pits left in the rubbish thus the earth does not cover over and encumber the surrounding ground which may very likely need to be excavated in its turn the stuff is removed a minimum distance which means occupying a minimum of time and cost and the site is covered over again to preserve from the weather and from plunderers any foundations or masonry that may remain every ounce of earth is thus examined and all it contains is discovered town ruins may be treated in the same way all the chambers along one side of the town or along a street may be cleared out and measured 
then the next chambers inwards are cleared and the stuff all thrown into the first row of chambers thus gradually turning over every scrap of rubbish without destroying a single wall and leaving the place as well protected by its coat of debris as it was before the work the most fatal difficulty in the way of reaching what is wanted is when an early site has been occupied in later times a city may have been of the greatest importance and we may be certain that beneath our feet are priceless monuments but if there are twenty or thirty feet of later rubbish over it all the things might almost as well be in the centre of the earth tennis was the hyksos capital but it would cost tens of thousands of pounds to lay bare the hyksos level the town of the twelfth dynasty at illahun on the contrary yielded a harvest of small objects and papyri revealing all the products and habits of that remote time at a cost of two or three hundred pounds simply because it was unencumbered the temple of ephesus cost sixteen thousand pounds and almost a life's work to discover it owing to its depth under the surface nacaratus and defenna on the contrary gave us the remains of the archaic greeks merely for the picking up and a little grubbing both together not costing a thousand it is plain enough that the main consideration is an accessible site an excellent rule in excavating is never to dig any where without some definite aim form at least some expectation of what may be found and so soon as the general clue to the arrangement is known have clearly in the mind what you expect to find and what is the purpose of every separate man's work one may be following the outside of a fortification another trenching across it to find its thickness another sinking a pit inside it to find the depth of the soil another clearing a room or trenching to find the limits of the town or removing a rubbish deposit layer by layer unless just beginning work on a very featureless site the aimless trenching or pitting is merely an excuse for a lazy mind far better have some theory or working hypothesis and labor to prove it to be either right or wrong than simply remain in expectancy when you know what to look for the most trivial indications which otherwise would seem to be nothing become of great importance and attract the eye and the workman should be encouraged to know what to expect beneath the surface as it prevents their destroying the evidences a vertical junction a few inches high clean sand on one side and earth on the other will lead to tracing the whole plan of a destroyed temple a little patch of sand in the ground will produce a foundation deposit to your hands and give the age of a building which has vanished a slightly darker soil in a trench will show you the wall of a town which you are seeking some bricks laid with mud instead of sand in a pyramid will point the way to the sepulchre a beginner is vastly disappointed that some great prize does not turn up after a week or two of work while all the time he is probably not noticing or thinking about material for historical results that is lying before him all the time perhaps in some place nothing whatever may be found that would be worth sixpence in the antiquary market and yet the results from walls and plans and pottery and measurements may be what historians have been longing to know about for years before it need hardly be said that the greatest care is required in making certain as to exactly where things are found workmen should never be allowed to meddle with each other's as lots of potsherds or little things and any man mixing up things from elsewhere with his own finds should be dismissed men should be trained by questioning to report where they found objects at what level and spot in their holes and the best men may be in this way be led up to astonishing intelligence observing exactly how they find things and replacing them as found to illustrate the matter in order to encourage the men to preserve all they find and to prevent their being induced to secret things of value they should always be paid as a present the market value of such things at that place and a trifle for any pottery or little scraps that may be wanted to do this properly it is needful to know the local prices pretty closely so as to ensure getting everything and on the other hand not to induce men to foist things into the work from other places wages are paid by measure whenever possible as it avoids the need of keeping the men up to the work and is happier for both parties some day work intermixed where measurement is impossible will often suffice it would be thought at first that nothing could be easier than to know a wall when you see it yet both in egypt and palestine the discrimination of mud-brick walls from the surrounding soil and rubbish in which they are buried 
is one of the most tedious and perplexing tasks to settle what is a wall and what is washed mud and to find the limits and clear the face of the wall is often a matter of half an hour's examination the two opposite ways of working are by trenching sections through the wall or by clearing the faces of it the first is clumsy but is needful sometimes especially if the wall is much like the soil and the workman cannot be trusted as if the face is cleared the whole outside may be cut away without leaving any trace the light on the surface is all important as any shadows or oblique lights mask the difference of the bricks either all in sunshine or better all in shade it is needful to see the bricks a distant general view will often show differences of time in the courses yellow red brown gray or black which prove the mass to have been brickwork the most decisive test is the difference at a vertical joint between bricks as that cannot be simulated by natural beds of washed earth as courses sometimes are the lines of mud mortar are also different in, in color from the bricks and show out the courses but yet all the question of joints is deceptive sometimes owing to fallen bricks lying flat and even fallen lumps of wall in order to see the surface it must be fresh cut or better fresh broken by flaking it with picking at the face by chopping successively front and back each cut flakes away the mark of the previous blow and so leaves a clean fracture surface all over it must be remembered that bricks are often bent out of form by solid flow of the wall under great pressure so that they may be distorted almost like a glacial deposit in cleaning down the face of a wall it may often be traced by its hardness but this is not a test to be left to workmen or they may cut away at random a very good plan is to let the man trench along a few inches outside of the face of the wall and then cut down the remaining coat of rubbish one's self to bear the face though pottery stones etc often serve to show what is accumulated soil yet they are found in bricks sometimes and must not be relied upon entirely the texture of the soil is important as in accumulations all long bodies bits of straw etc lie flat whereas in brick they are all mixed in one direction also washed down earth almost always shows worm casts in it often a wall if in low wet soil will show out distinctly when the cut surface has dried as cracks will form more readily along the joints in many cases however all these tests hardly serve to unravel the puzzle especially where there are successive walls superimposed and only a small height of any one to examine to trace out the position of ancient walls is however one of the first requisites in such work not only do we recover the plan of the town and its buildings but we are led thus to recognize what may be the most important sites for special excavation one of the most difficult questions is to know what may safely be thrown away most trivial things may be of value as giving a clue to something else generally it is better to keep some examples of everything no matter how broken the potsherds may be keep one of each kind and form replacing it by more complete examples as the work goes on thus the collection that is kept is always in process of weeding it need hardly be said that every subject should be attended to the excavator's business is not to study his own specialty only but to collect as much material as possible for the use of other students to neglect the subjects that interest him less is not only a waste of his opportunities but a waste of such archaeological material as may never be equalled again history inscriptions tools ornaments pottery technical works weight sources of imported stone ethnology botany colors and any other unexpected subject that may turn up must all have a due share of attention and keeping up the record of where everything has been found and all the information that will afterwards be needed about the objects and the discoveries the measurements and details for publication is a serious part of the work however much it may be desired to preserve some things they almost defy the excavator's care it is a simple affair to get an antiquity safe out of the ground but then begins its perils of destruction and unless carefully attended to it may slowly perish in a few days or weeks the first great trouble is salt it scales the face of stones or makes them drop off in powder 
it destroys the surface of pottery it eats away metal in all cases where salt exists it is imperative to soak the objects in two or three changes of water for hours or days according to the thickness i have done this even with rotten wood and with paper squeezes another source of trouble is the rotting of organic materials wood string leather cloth etc for all such things the best treatment is a bath of melted wax but innumerable questions arise as work goes on which can only be settled according to their circumstances still the soaking bath and the wax pot are the main preservatives the excavator should always be ready to take squeezes or photographs at once when required and it is the best rule always to copy every inscription as soon as it is seen if only an hour had been spent on the stele of mesha how much less should we have to regret there is always the chance of accidents and no risks should be run with inscribed materials even when the owner will not allow a copy to be made the most needful points may be committed to memory and written down as soon as possible even under guise of making notes on other subjects another matter in which it is essential that an excavator should be proficient is surveying and leveling in order to understand a place and direct the work in order to preserve a record of what is done and make it intelligible to others a survey is always needed and generally leveling as well lastly what most persons never think of a great deal of time and attention is required for safely packing a collection this part of the business generally takes about a fifth of the time of the excavations and much care and arrangement has to be bestowed on the security of heavy stones or pottery or fragile stucco or glass for a long journey of railways and shipping packing with pads with cloths with chopped straw or with reeds hay or straw is more or less suitable in different instances finding things is but sorry work if you cannot preserve them and transport them safely most people think of excavating as a pleasing sort of holiday amusement just walking about a place and seeing things found but it takes about as much care and management as any other business and needs perhaps more miscellaneous information than most other affairs end of section number twenty two this recording is in the public domain section twenty three of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by the story girl portal of euergetus the first thebes photograph page eighty four with the intense eagerness of the egyptians to rear gigantic memorials of their greatness they built pyramids and gates and arches in vast numbers one of the most famous of the portals is here pictured it was built by ptolemy euergetus the first who began his reign in 247 B.C. He was successful as a warrior and extended his conquests even beyond the Euphrates, bringing home vast loads of treasure. An idea of the size of this portal may be gathered from the human figures at its base. At the top is the winged sun-disk in the hollow of the cornice, the hieroglyphics on the sides represent Euergetus praying and offering sacrifices to Theban deities. This portal served as the entrance to the temple precincts of Karnak. Beyond it was an avenue of sphinxes leading to the temple of Amun-Ra. No other building in the world can match the dimensions of this gigantic temple, which is so vast that the mighty cathedral of notre dame at paris might be placed in the smallest of the three groups of buildings of which it is composed with room to spare end of section twenty three this recording is in the public domain section twenty four of egypt africa and arabia Read for LibriVox.org. Egypt, Part 4. In the Days of Pharaoh. Historical Note. The first ruler of the 19th dynasty was Seti, who built the famous Hall of Columns in the Temple of Karnak. He was followed by Ramses II. 
This ruler was apparently carefully trained to meet the responsibilities of the throne, for one inscription declares that when he was only ten years old, no monuments were built without his orders. He had a long reign and was successful in some military expeditions, but his fashion of removing from monuments the names of earlier kings and substituting his own makes the number of his conquests somewhat uncertain. He has long been regarded as the pharaoh who oppressed the children of Israel, and his son as the ruler who was forced by the ten plagues to let them depart from the land. But recent criticism has made this somewhat less certain. End of section 24section 25 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world's story volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section 25 the mighty reign of sesostris rameses the second by diodorus the sicilian not only the greek writers differ among themselves about this king but likewise the egyptian priests and poets relate various and different stories concerning him we shall relate such as are most probable and agreeable to those signs and marks that are yet remaining in egypt to confirm them after his birth his father performed a noble act and becoming a king he caused all throughout egypt that were born the same day with his son to be brought together and together with his son to be bred up with the same education and instructed in the same discipline and exercises conceiving that by being thus familiarly brought up together and conversing with one another they would be always most loving and faithful friends and the best fellow-soldiers in all the wars providing therefore everything for the purpose he caused the boys to be exercised daily in the schools with hard and difficult labours as that none should eat till he had run a hundred and fourscore furlongs and by this means when they came to be at men's estate they were fit either to be commanders or to undertake any brave or noble action both in respect of the vigour and strength of their bodies and the excellent endowments of their minds sesostris in the first place being sent with an army into arabia by his father with whom went his companions that were bred up with him toiled and troubled himself with the hunting and killing of wild beasts and then having at last overmastered all his fatigues and wants of water and provision he conquered all that barbarous nation which was never before that time subdued afterwards being sent into the western parts he conquered the greatest part of libya being as yet but a youth coming to the crown after the death of his father encouraged by his former successes he designed to subdue and conquer the whole world some report that he was stirred up by his daughter atherti to undertake the gaining of the empire of the world for being a woman of an extraordinary understanding she made it out to her father that the conquest was easy others encouraged him by their divinations foretelling his success by the entrails of the sacrifices by their dreams in the temples and by prodigies seen in the air there are some also that write that when sesostris was born vulcan appeared to his father in his sleep and told him that the child then born should be conqueror of the universe and that that was the reason why his father assembled all of the like age and bred them up together with his son to make way for him with more ease to rise to that height of imperial dignity and that when he was grown to man's estate fully believing what the god had foretold he undertook at length this expedition to this purpose he first made it his chief concern to gain the love and good will of all the egyptians judging it necessary in order to effect what he designed so far to engage his soldiers as that they should willingly and readily venture nay lose 
their lives for their generals and that those whom he should leave behind him should not contrive or hatch any rebellion in his absence to this end therefore he obliged every one to the utmost of his power working upon some by money others by giving them lands and many by free pardons and upon all by fair words and affable and courteous behaviour he pardoned those that were condemned for high treason and freed all that were in prison for debt by paying what they owed of whom there was a vast multitude in the jails he divided the whole country into thirty-six parts which the egyptians called nomi over every one of which he appointed a governor who should take care of the king's revenue and manage all other affairs relating to their several and respective provinces out of these he chose the strongest and ablest men and raised an army answerable to the greatness of his design to the number of six hundred thousand foot and twenty four thousand horse and twenty seven thousand chariots of war and over all the several regiments and battalions he made those as had been used to martial exercises and from their childhood hot and zealous after that which was brave and virtuous and who were knit together as brothers in love and affection both to the king and to one another the number of whom was above seventeen hundred upon these companions of his he bestowed large estates in lands in the richest parts of egypt that they might not be in the least want of anything reserving only their attendance upon him in the wars having therefore rendezvoused his army he marched first against the ethiopians inhabiting the south and having conquered them forced them to pay him tribute of ebony gold and elephants teeth then he sent forth a navy of four hundred sail into the red sea and was the first egyptian that built long ships by the help of this fleet he gained all the islands in this sea and subdued the bordering nations as far as to india but he himself marching forward with his land army conquered all asia for he not only invaded those nations which alexander the macedonian afterwards subdued but likewise those which he never set foot upon for he both passed over the river ganges and likewise pierced through all india to the main ocean then he subdued the scythians as far as to the river tanais which divided europe from asia where they say he left some of his egyptians at the lake meotis and gave origin to the nation of caucus in the same manner he brought into his subjection all the rest of asia and most of the islands of the cyclades thence passing over into europe he was in danger of losing his whole army through the difficulty of the passages and want of provisions and therefore putting a stop to his expedition in thrace up and down in all his conquests he erected pillars whereon were inscribed in egyptian letters called hieroglyphics these words sesostris king of kings and lord of lords subdued this country by his arms in some places he set up his own statue carved in stone armed with a bow and a lance above four cubits and four hands in height of which stature he himself was footnote about eight feet End of footnote having now spent nine years in this expedition carrying himself courteously and familiarly towards all his subjects in the meantime he ordered the nations he had conquered to bring their presents and tributes every year into egypt every one proportionable to their several abilities and he himself with the captives and the rest of the spoils of which there were a vast quantity returned into egypt far surpassing all the kings before him in the greatness of his actions and achievements he adorned all the temples of egypt with rich presents and the spoils of his enemies then he rewarded his soldiers that had served him in the war every one according to his desert 
it is most certain that the army not only returned loaded with riches and received the glory and honour of their approved valour but the whole country of egypt reaped many advantages by this expedition sesostris having now disbanded his army gave leave to his companions in arms and fellow-victors to take their ease and enjoy the fruits of their conquest but he himself fired with an earnest desire of glory and ambitious to leave behind him eternal monuments of his memory made many fair and stately works admirable both for their cost and contrivance by which he both advanced his own immortal praise and procured unspeakable advantages to the egyptians with perfect ease and security for the time to come for beginning first with what concerned the gods he built a temple in all the cities of egypt to that god whom every particular place most adored and he employed none of the egyptians in his works but finished all by the labours of the captives and therefore he caused an inscription to be made upon all the temples thus none of the natives were put to labour here it is reported that some of the babylonian captives because they were not able to bear the fatigue of the work rebelled against the king and having possessed themselves of a fort near the river they took up arms against the egyptians and wasted the country thereabouts but at length having got a pardon they chose a place for their habitation and called it after the name of that in their own country babylon upon the like occasion they say that troy situated near the river nile was so called for menelaus when he returned from ilium with many prisoners arrived in egypt where the trojans deserting the king seized upon a certain strong place and took up arms against the greeks till they had gained their liberty and then built a famous city after the name of their own but i am not ignorant how Cetesius the cretan gives a far different account of these cities when he says that some of those who came in former times with semiramis into egypt called the cities which they built after the names of those in their own country but it is no easy matter to know the certain truth of these things yet it is necessary to observe the different opinions concerning them that the judicious reader may have an occasion to inquire in order to pick out the real truth sesostris moreover raised many mounds and banks of earth to which he removed all the cities that lay low in the plain that both man and beast might be safe and secure at the time of the inundation of the river he cut likewise many deep dikes from the river all along as far as from memphis to the sea for the ready and quick conveying of corn and other provisions and merchandise by short cuts thither both for the support of trade and commerce and maintenance of peace and plenty all over the country and that which was of greatest moment and concern of all was that he fortified all parts of the country against incursions of enemies and made it difficult of access whereas before the greatest part of egypt lay open and exposed either for chariots or horsemen to enter but now by reason of the multitude of canals drawn all along from the river the entrance was very difficult and the country not so easily to be invaded he defended likewise the east side of egypt against the eruptions of the syrians and arabians with a wall drawn from pelusium through the desert as far as to heliopolis for the space of a thousand and five hundred furlongs footnote one hundred and eighty seven and one half miles End of footnote he caused likewise a ship to be made of cedar two hundred and four score cubits in length footnote about four hundred and seventy eight feet End of footnote gilded over with gold on the outside and with silver within and this he dedicated to the god that was most adored by the thebans he erected likewise two obelisks of polished marble a hundred and twenty cubits high on which were inscribed a description of the large extent of his empire the great value of his revenue and the number of the nations by him conquered 
he placed likewise at memphis in the temple of vulcan his and his wife's statues each of one entire stone thirty cubits in height and those of his sons twenty cubits high upon this occasion after his return from his great expedition into egypt being at pelusium his brother at a feast having invited him together with his wife and children plotted against his life for being all overcome by wine and gone to rest he caused a great quantity of dry reeds long before prepared for the purpose to be placed round the king's pavilion in the night and set them all on fire upon which the flame suddenly mounted aloft and little assistance the king had either from his servants or life-guard who were all still overloaden with wine upon which sesostris with his hands lift up to heaven calling upon the gods for help for his wife and children rushed through the flames and escaped and so being thus unexpectedly preserved he made oblations as to other of the gods as is before said so especially to vulcan as him by whose favour he was so remarkably delivered although sesostris was eminent in many great and worthy actions yet the most stately and magnificent of all was that relating to the princes in his progresses for those kings of the conquered nations who through his favour still held their kingdoms and such as had received large principalities of his free gift and donation came with their presents and tributes into egypt at the times appointed whom he received with all the marks of honour and respect save that when he went into the temple of the city his custom was to cause the horses to be unharnessed out of his chariot and in their room for kings and other princes to draw it hereby thinking to make it evident to all that there was none comparable to him for valour who had conquered the most potent and famous princes in the world this king seems to have excelled all others that ever were eminent for power and greatness both as to his warlike achievements the number of his gifts and oblations and his wonderful works in egypt after he had reigned three and thirty years he fell blind and wilfully put an end to his own life for which he was admired not only by priests but by all the rest of the egyptians for that as he had before manifested the greatness of his mind by his actions so now his end was agreeable by a voluntary death to the glory of his life the fame and renown of this king continued so fresh down to posterity that many ages after when egypt was conquered by the persians and darius the father of xerxes would set up his statue at memphis above that of sesostris the chief priest in the debating of the matter in the conclave boldly spoke against it declaring that darius had not yet exceeded this that on the contrary he was so pleased and taken with this freedom of speech that he said he would endeavour if he lived as long as the other did to be nothing inferior to him and wished them to compare things done proportionably to the time for that this was the justice examination and trial of valour and thus much shall suffice to be said of sesostris in of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain Section 26 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 26 the story of joseph from the old testament the cruel brethren now israel loved joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colours and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him 
and joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren and they hated him yet the more and he said unto them here i pray you this dream which i have dreamed for behold we were binding sheaves in the field and lo my sheaf arose and also stood upright and behold your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf and his brethren said to him shalt thou indeed reign over us or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said behold i have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me and he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him what is this dream that thou hast dreamed shall i and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth and his brethren envied him but his father observed the saying and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in shechem and israel said unto joseph do not thy brethren feed the flock in shechem come and i will send thee unto them and he said to him here am i and he said to him go i pray thee see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks and bring me word again so he sent him out of the vale of hebron and he came to shechem and a certain man found him and behold he was wandering in the field and the man asked him saying what seekest thou and he said i seek my brethren tell me i pray thee where they feed their flocks and the man said they are departed hence for i heard them say let us go to dothan and joseph went after his brethren and found them in dothan and when they saw him afar off even before he came near unto them they conspired against him to slay him and they said one to another behold this dreamer cometh come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams and reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said let us not kill him and reuben said unto them shed no blood but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again and it came to pass when joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped joseph out of his coat his coat of many colours that was on him and they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty there was no water in it and they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold a company of ishmaelites came from gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to egypt and judah said unto his brethren what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood come and let us sell him to the ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content then there passed by midianites merchantmen and they drew and lifted up joseph out of the pit and sold joseph to the ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver and they brought joseph into egypt and reuben returned unto the pit and behold joseph was not in the pit and he rent his clothes and he returned unto his brethren and said the child is not and i whither shall i go and they took joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood 
and they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and captain of the guard. Joseph in prison in Egypt. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person, and well favoured. And it came to pass, after these things, that his master's wife falsely accused Joseph of wrongdoing. And when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison." But the Lord was with Joseph, and shewed him mercy, and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to any thing that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did. The Lord made it to prosper. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly to-day? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. 
and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded and her blossoms shot forth. And the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head, and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and shew kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon." When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there was of all manner of bake meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Pharaoh's Dream and it came to pass, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favoured kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow, and behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favoured and lean-fleshed and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favoured and lean-fleshed kine did eat up the seven well-favoured and fat kine. So Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in ward and the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. 
and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kine, fat-fleshed and well-favored. And they fed in a meadow, and behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favoured and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favoured kine did eat up the first seven fat kine, and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favoured as at the beginning. So I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good, and behold, seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath shewed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kine are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one, and the seven thin and ill-favoured kine that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he sheweth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let him keep food in the cities, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine. Joseph becomes a ruler in Egypt. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath shewed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. 
and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh gave him to wife, Azeneth, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons, before the years of famine came, which Azenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said and the dearth was in all lands. But in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses, and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Joseph's brethren come to Egypt. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them, and he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, 
and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies, hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into ward three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them, and wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn, and to restore every man's money into his sack, and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And they laded their asses with the corn, and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money, for behold it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? And they came unto Jacob their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man, who is the lord of the land, spake roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone, and bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land." And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave." the silver cup, and the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, 
go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whither ye had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state, and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee. Then let me bear the blame for ever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels, and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hand. And the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother, and arise, go again unto the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up, and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home, and slay, and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid, because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us, and take us for bondmen and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house, and said, O oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass, when we came to the inn, that we opened our sacks, and, behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house, and gave them water. And they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender. And they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house, and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare, and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health, he is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes, 
and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother, of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face, and went out, and refrained himself, and said, Set on bread. And they set on for him by himself, and for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians which did eat with them by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marvelled one at another. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him, but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far off, Joseph said unto the steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And he searched, and began at the eldest, and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes, and laid at every man his ass, and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, 
and he alone is left to his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we have said unto my lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my lord. And our father said, Go again, and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father for ever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall be neither earing, footnote, plowing, end of footnote, nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you, and ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. 
and he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well, and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beasts, and go, get you unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall see the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, Take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons, according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed, and he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. Jacob goes down into Egypt. And they went up out of Egypt, and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And Israel took his journey with all that he had, and came to Beersheba, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hands upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little ones, and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph, to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot, and went up to meet Israel his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. And Joseph said unto his brethren, and unto his father's house, I will go up and shew Pharaoh, and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, 
for their trade hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass, when Pharaoh shall call you, and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh, and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land we are come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee, the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell, and if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father, and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and went out from before Pharaoh. End of section 26 This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by The Story Girl Joseph Sold by His Brethren By Henry Frederick Chupin Born in Lübeck of French parents in 1804 Died 1880 Painting, page 100 This picture by Chupin, the noted Bible illustrator, shows a striking scene of desert life. A caravan is coming to a halt under the shade of the palm trees. A tent has already been spread. The women are climbing down from their lofty perch, and one girl has set out for the well, bearing on her head a water jar of a type that has been used in eastern countries from time immemorial. Joseph has just been sold by his brothers, who are seen on the left, receiving the money. Joseph himself is being led away under the pitying gaze of the Arab maidens. A picturesque background is furnished by the camels, some of them bearing huge baskets in which the women of the caravan ride, and others the awkward-looking saddles on which the men balance themselves. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain.